Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today, I'm beginning a new series in a new format on my channel, and I'm really excited to introduce it to you guys. But before we get started, I actually have a bit of housekeeping to do, and then I want to talk a little bit about what my goals are for this new series. So. First of all, I want to thank you all for the positive feedback I got on my first vlog. I'm excited to bring more content like that to you in the future, so I really appreciate all of the really kind comments and the feedback that I got. Thank you very much. Um, and then secondly, I want to apologize for the long delay in what is my normal and traditional content, which is literary analysis. Uh, I have switched jobs a couple times in my uh, recent past. And so my upheaval in my work has meant that I've been both busy and had an irregular schedule, which has made filming a little bit more difficult than usual. But with all that said, I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit about Victorian England. So basically how this series came about is that I was preparing to do The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, which will be the next series that I'll do after we finish talking about Victorian England. And in my effort to kind of bring even better content to my channel, I decided that I actually wanted to do some research before I did this video. Normally I read the book, I work from my own educational background, and then also bring my own observations to the work. So I don't spend a lot of time doing research with outside resources uh, before I do my videos. I do take a lot of time and take a lot of notes, but it's really just working from my own personal knowledge and my own personal background. But I realized there's so much more out there and there's so many great resources. And I recently got like all of my books from my parents' house in my own house. Um, and so that gave me easy access to some really great resources that I thought would flesh out what I already knew about the novel, what I gleaned from the introduction and then uh, just kind of go from there. But then it turned into like, oh my gosh, I have so much to share about this that I learned. Um, so now I kind of like broke it off into its own video series because there's a lot of content to cover here. So here we are. Let's get started with a primer on Victorian England. So first of all, I want to uh, share the resources that I used for my research so that they get properly sourced. I will be quoting from them um, throughout this series and I'll let you know which one um, I'm working from. And I'll also leave a link to the Amazon listing in the description down below. Presumably I can find it so that you can pick up a copy if you want to. So the first one is this anthology called Victorian Literature from 1830 to 1900. And this is put together by Dorothy Merman and Herbert Tucker. Um, and this was a book that, wow, that was loud. This was a book that I picked up for my Victorian Literature course. It was the anthology that that professor chose. And um, the essays and selections were edited by these two persons. Um, the second one that I used, which I'll actually be quoting from more extensively than even that one, is from the British Anthology of Literature by Longman. So the Longman Anthology of British Literature. Um, and so this is volume B, which has the section of uh, Victorian literature. I have volume A up above me. You can just see there. Uh, the green. Why is this so hard? Oh my gosh. But you can see like the green bottom of that. Anyway, that's not important. You don't need to know that it's above my head. Um, but anyway, this section covers the Victorian age and the essays on the Victorian age were written by um, Heather Hendrickson and William Sharp. And they also pulled out the selections for the readings as well. So those are my two main sources that I used while researching this. Um, and if you wanted to learn more, then you can always check out those resources yourself. Okay, so dates and stuff and the basic background. Um, for uh, this video, I'm dating um, the Victorian era from 1832 to 1901, and it's the dates that the Longman Anthology uses. Now, it's really interesting because, of course, the Victorian era encompasses the time when Queen Victoria was reigning over, the, over England, um, but this date is actually 1832 predates her coronation, and the reason why that date is sometimes selected and was selected by Longman is because that was the date that the first reform bill was passed. A key aspect of Victorian culture was this goal 
tool for reformation, usually through legislation. Um, and because it was such a dominant force of their culture and the era, that is the date that they selected rather than the date of her coronation because it was really something that um, the Victorians did and not so much the Romantics. Um, and so that makes it a little bit of a gray area and open to interpretation as great historians will remind us. Um, but it's really important and foundational date or around the, an important and foundational event for the Victorian era. It's important to keep in mind that the Victorian era is dawning upon a new period of peace for the British. They have previous to this been locked in a series of interminable wars and even through the Middle Ages with France as they have been duking it out over who is really going to be the superpower in this time. Obviously in the Middle Ages Spain was a big player at the time but as we exit the Middle Ages through the Renaissance and into um, the Romantic era really it's between England and France. Um, and England emerges dominant on this world stage. And this era of peace and prosperity that is going to be a part of the um, Victorian history allows the nation to kind of step back and take stock. And they're starting to ask deep philosophical questions um, about themselves. Um, one is, who was England? What is England? What does it represent? Um, who is British? Obviously some conflict with Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, and the definition of what is England, what is British, what is Britain, um, is going to be really essential to be answered during this time. What does their culture mean and represent? Um, they also had a lot of religious searching, right? There's a lot of philosophical questions. Is the Bible true? Can it be trusted? How do we reconcile what we see in our traditional faith with, with what we're learning in this new era of science? What does science tell us? Um, as, as well as a objective look into historical inquiry. So that's going to bring questions upon the traditional view of religion as well. Um, is art useful? They're very much into utility as we have this dawn of industrialization and profit and progress. Um, and then also about what is moral and good and if the Bible is no longer true, how do we define our morality and our social rules? How do we now understand them as Darwinism comes on the rise and social Darwinism begins to enter in as a possible way to answer those questions. I want to start with one quote from the Longman Anthology that really gets at the essence of Victorian culture and I think it's a really great example um, and a way to understand Victorian culture as we begin our discussion. So here it is. Every generalization about the Victorians comes with a ready-made contradiction. They were materialists, but religious, self-confident, but insecure, monstrous exploiters, but devoted themselves to humane reforms. They were given to blanket pronouncements about the essential nature of sexes, races, the social order, and the Christian universe, but they relentlessly probed the foundations of their thought. They demanded moral literature and thrilled to mindless page turners. In short, the Victorians are grappling with some of the most essential questions about human nature, the most essential metaphysical questions that we often ask ourselves. Um, and they are answering them through their legislation, through their literature and art, and through their daily work. The result is a variety of answers really centered around how best, how best to live. Overlaying all of this is, of course, this very profoundly powerful presence of Queen Victoria herself. And she went through massive changes as a symbol and as a person throughout the era. She begins as this young and beautiful queen, happily married and giving birth to many children, um, and ends up as this sort of uh, symbol of maternal love and sort of this dowager queen, heavily jowled and not so youthful and pretty anymore. And this vision of her actually became, you know, present everywhere as printing presses, as the idea, identity of this, uh, of who, England was becomes wrapped up in the vision of what Queen Victoria is. She becomes printed on advertisements, on soaps, on coins, on all kinds of literature and becomes symbolic not only for the country but also for their industry. Um, and ironically at the same time while her image is being plastered everywhere she becomes more and more of a recluse, private and leading from behind a curtain if you will. 
obviously uh, ideas and ideals of proper behavior, propriety, morality is extremely important during this Victorian era. Dressing yourself and comporting yourself in the proper way is really, really important. This conservative and traditional moral viewpoint. Um, at the same time, literature becomes a playground for questioning these assumptions. Um, where characters are put in compromising situations, moral quandaries, or suffered indignities as they try to understand how these morals should be put into practice in a world that is very imperfect. This contradictory approach reflected the struggles that they were having in their own society. So they have this contradiction that they're really, really struggling with. They have this sense of national pride at the same time that they're having these sort of uh, questions about who, who is the, who, what is the identity of England? What does England represent? We have the OED is first published during this era. So they're contracting down on language, which is a huge cultural representation of who you are as a people. At the same time as that, there is this return and reinforcement of the power and authority of the Church of England. Again, religion is this very powerful representative of who you are as a nation. And, um, they have the uh, great uh, expositions uh, you hosted in England. So if you think of, uh, there were some hosted in France too. So like the Tower of the, the Tower of Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower was built for one of these grand exposés as a demonstration of arts and science and progress and industry. And here again, England is showing off on the world stage and becoming this superpower, revealing itself as the superpower. Likewise, the growth of industry makes them dominant on the world. And this is the era where the sun never set on the British Empire. Colonialism had spread so far and the empire was so huge that one in four people on the face of the planet was considered a subject of Queen Victoria. So wildly powerful, very productive, uh, wealthier than ever before. People have more things than ever before. And all of this is seen as a blessing of God on this country. At the same time, they're f facing this moral quandary. This plentitude, this um, success is all done on the backs of, if not slavery, which was outlawed during this time, but their work in colonialism and their support of other industries out of America and buying of purchases still kept them intertwined with the slave trade, even while it was uh, outlawed during this era. Um, so we have questions about slavery. So if not on the backs of slaves, then on the backs of destitute, weak, and um, unprotected working class people. Oftentimes children and women were some of the most exploited during this time in factories and in unsafe conditions. And this is where their desire for reform comes out. So at the same time that they're seeing this um, a success as, as a representative of the blessing of God, they also see that it's also being achieved by these means that they know are, are immoral from that worldview. And this is part of the huge contradicti contradiction that's underlying everything that they're experiencing and what they must work out. So that's all that I have for you today um, for our first video on Victorian England. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, if you get value out of these videos, please give it a like, um, subscribe to my channel, and if you want another way to support me, consider becoming a patron. I'll have the links down below. Until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.